I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this latest edition of Zoom with COA. Uh, illegal EU-backed Palestinian building in Area C, featuring Naomi Khan, director of Rugavi International Division. The program will be moderated by ZOA's Israel representative, Dan Aluz. Your microphones are muted. Please leave them that way for the duration of the call. And we ask that all questions be posted in the Zoom chat feature, which you'll find toward the middle bottom of your screen. Uh, the presentation should last about 40 to 45 minutes. Q&A will be conducted and moderated by Dan Luz uh, toward the end of the program. My name is Alan Jay. I'm the Acting Director of uh, Outreach and Engagement here at ZOA, and I'd like to welcome you all. And I'd like to let you know that everybody here at ZOA hopes and prays that all of you on this call here in the United States and in Israel, are and remain safe and healthy. Since the pandemic began, uh, we at ZOA realized the need to keep our membership engaged and informed. So far, we've offered over 70 Zoom with ZOA webinars and book club meetings, all pretty high quality if we don't say so ourselves. If you've missed the program, no problem. You can click on the YouTube icon at the top of our ZOA homepage, zoa.org. You'll find uh, the YouTube icon and all of our recorded Zoom with ZOA programs, you can do a search and we'll put a link uh, in the chat for uh, that page on our website. ZOA has been a leader in pro-Israel and pro-Jewish advocacy since 1897, operating continuously through our Center for Law and Justice, our Department of Government Relations, our ZOA campus division and our regional offices around the country. ZOA shares history, facts, truth that clearly demonstrate Israel's right to be and remain a sovereign Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley, with Jerusalem as her undivided capital and with the right to defend herself if and whenever necessary. I would be remiss before I introduce the program if I didn't mention how excited we are here at ZOA. We are preparing our first ever virtual superstar gala. That is going to take place on December 27th. That's a Sunday evening. Uh, we have a, a superstar lineup, including Ambassador David Friedman, Ambassador, incoming Ambassador Gilad Erdan. We have um, uh, Dr. Miriam Adelson and uh, Ice Q and John Voigt. So we really do have quite a lineup. You can sign up on our website. Please register. When you register, please be as generous as you can. Our work is uh, extensive and it doesn't come cheap and we really need your help, and we are gonna provide you with a fantastic evening of entertainment. To the program. Dan Luz is our ZOA representative in Israel. He's originally from Montreal, Canada. He moved to Israel after finishing his legal studies at McGill University, specializing in international law. Dan serves as an international law advisor to the reserve duty. He's worked in the international law department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel as a legislative advisor to the Likud in the Knesset, as well as in senior management positions in Israel's third sector. And here to introduce our speaker and to moderate today's Q&A, uh, Dan Aluz. Dan, program's yours. Thank you so much, Alan. And I want to also thank Natalie for all their help in organizing this, uh, uh, this webinar. Uh, my name is Daniel Luz, as Alan said, and I'm uh, the Israel representative uh, of ZOA. My job basically is to connect uh, uh, the United States uh, and more specifically ZOA with everything that's going on in Israel. And it's a two-way street. So what I do is I, on the one hand, bring some quality content uh, to ZOA membership, such as this webinar that I hope you'll all uh, enjoy. But on the other hand, I also make sure that decision makers in Israel uh, know about what ZOA does in America. And this is incredibly important, especially in a time where there are so many post-Zionist voices coming out of the Jewish community in America. It's important for decision makers in Israel to know that there are staunchly pro-Israel Zionist uh, Jews uh, in America that will support Israel making the right decisions and will support Israel making the decisions that are right for its future. And so this is basically what I do in Israel. 
Uh, today, uh, our webinar, as Alan already mentioned, uh, is titled Illegal EU-backed Palestinian Building in Area C, uh, and it will be featuring Naomi Khan, the director of Regavim's uh, International Division. Uh, the mission of Regavim, uh, which is an organization that works in Israel, is to ensure responsible, legal, and accountable and environmentally friendly use of Israel's national lands and the return of the rule of law uh, to all areas and aspects of the land and its preservation. Basically, what they do is that they ensure also that the rights of the Jewish people in the lands uh, that, uh, that are part of the land of Israel uh, are protected uh, according to law, according to international law, and also according to uh, local uh, Israeli law. Uh, so I, I want to introduce to you our guest today, which is Naomi Khan. Uh, first of all, I'll start by saying a big thank you for Naomi for being uh, uh, here tonight. Uh, if you guys don't know, it's 2 a.m. in Israel, and so she stayed up uh, late uh, in order to give us this presentation. I want to thank her. Naomi received a degree in political science and Near East, uh, Eastern languages and literatures from New York University. She served as director of the Schools of Judaic Studies and of Education and Lender uh, Institute of Jerusalem and is a well-known editor and translator. Uh, Naomi is the director of the International Division at Regazim, as we said, uh, and together with her husband, Ari, uh, she raised her five children in Hibat Ze'ev, which is a small town way outside of Jerusalem, where the family has lived for over 30 years. Uh, Naomi, I, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Uh, if the sound is good, give me a thumbs up. Are you hearing me well? Good, excellent. Okay, thank you all. Uh, thank you particularly to Dan for setting this up and for all of you for, for giving me an opportunity to present some of Rigovium's work. Um, it's a pleasure really to speak to ZOA membership. It's really a pleasure to speak to a friendly crowd, even though you're not close enough for me to feel that warmth. Uh, it's a real change of pace. I spent most of my day today actually in battle with someone named Sarit Michaeli of Peace Now. Uh, if you go onto uh, Twitter and you follow the exchange that we've had all day, you'll see why it's such a pleasure for me to actually speak to people that I that that that, that are like-minded and also are well-educated and well-aware of the issues that we're facing. So tonight's topic is um, European Union-backed illegal construction, Palestinian Authority illegal construction in Area C. Now that's a, a big title. So before we actually dive into it, I wanna give a little bit of background so that we understand what it is that makes this construction illegal. And then we can discuss what the, uh, what the impact of this illegal construction is. So before we go into that, I'd like to give you just a very, very brief uh, introduction to Rigavim itself. I'm going to share my screen now and show you some slides. Here we are. So Rigavim, as Dan um, tried to describe in a nutshell, a very, very large, uh, mission that we have cut, carved out for ourselves. We try to protect Israel's resources from misuse. We try to ensure that there is a strong, healthy Jewish homeland to pass down to our children and grandchildren. So we start from the most basic resource of the Jewish people, and that is the land itself, the land of Israel, literally the land. We go out into the field every day we divide the country up into sectors and we send out field coordinators and we go out into the field to see what's there. We do intensive field work, we, we investigate, we document and we research every bit of construction, every bit of every change on the face of the map of the land of Israel to see who's doing what, who's allowed to do what, who owns what and who doesn't own what and what we can do about it. Then we do something no one else does. We take a step back and we connect the dots and we see what picture emerges from all of that. We try to understand the, the larger picture, how it affects the present, the future, and what the purpose, if there is one, of all of this activity is out on the ground. So these are some of the people that I work with uh, and these are just shots of them at work, 
out in the field, we use drones, uh, we use cameras, we use computers, we use legal research, we use archival research, we use global images, satellite images, to try to understand what it is that we're seeing out in the field. Then we formulate policy recommendations. We work very intensively in lobbying and in the Knesset, uh, as well as in the media and abroad to try to correct things that need correcting in order to protect the land of Israel. So now I'm gonna give you a two minute history lesson, which will bring us all up to the same page, to up, all of us up to speed about what it is that makes the construction we're going to discuss this evening illegal. So for most of you, this will be extremely repetitive and will not be anything new, but I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. So we begin more or less uh, at the end of, in the aftermath of World War I, the Ottoman Empire falls apart. The uh, victorious powers carve up the areas that were under Ottoman, Turkish Ottoman control uh, and set aside at that time um, a piece of land for the creation of a Jewish homeland. The picture that you see here, this is the map. Uh, both of those yellowish colors were set aside for the Jewish homeland. At a certain point, that was in 1917, 1918. By 1922, the British, who had been placed uh, in charge of this area as caretakers until such time as a, an independent Jewish state could be formed, forgot what they were supposed to be doing here, um, lopped off 80% of the territory and created what they called at the time Transjordan, which soon became known as Jordan. They brought in a monarch from the Arabian Peninsula and installed him as a king of Jordan. Uh, all of this was the first two-state solution. Uh, the two-state solution at that time was meant to prevent further bloodshed, to create a, um, a Jewish homeland alongside a Palestinian Arab homeland in order to resolve the conflict once and for all. I think we all know that that two-state solution was a failure. But in any case, notice where the, where the lines are. This was the border that was created by the British Mandate. This is Jordan. And this is Palestine, Israel. Notice again, very important to notice, that the areas we're going to be discussing tonight, Judea and Samaria, were always part of the Jewish homeland that was envisioned by the world powers and was agreed upon by the United Nations and the British Mandate and everyone else. So that's how the map looked until 1947, when the United Nations realized that the first two-state solution was not solving the problem and was not bringing an end to the bloodshed and conflict, and they suggested a second two-state solution to redivide the 20% of remaining territory and create a Palestinian and a Jewish homeland. The Arabs rejected this plan, even though the uh, Jewish community living here at the time agreed to this plan, uh, and this was what the map would have looked like. This is the map that resulted from the War, the war of Independence of 1948. Two important points to point out, which I'm sure you all know, is number one, that in 1948, the State of Israel was engaged uh, in a war of self-preservation. And the, the Arab countries surrounding Israel were the aggressors. They attacked Israel. And at that time, one of the aggressors, Jordan, illegally occupied territory that was uh, over the border on the western bank of the Jordan River. At that time, they created a new name for this area in order to justify their illegal annexation, uh, occupation and eventual annexation of the territory. They began to call it the West Bank, implying that it was simply the other side but Jordan. Until that time, this, this name had never been used. It had not existed in history. And this area was always known as Judea and Samaria for several thousand years. So this is what the map looked like between 1948 and 1967. In 1967, this area, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, 
was repatriated. The state of Israel liberated the territory that was originally and always intended to be part of the state of Israel. Unfortunately, at that time, the state of Israel declined to uh, extend sovereignty to the areas that it repatriated. And that was the fateful decision. At that time, in 1967, the state of Israel, assuming that this would be a temporary situation, agreed voluntarily to treat this area as a contested territory and to extend voluntarily the Geneva Conventions to this area and to administer it temporarily under um, a condition of non-sovereignty, at first military rule and then civilian rule administered by the Israelis uh, the Israeli Civil Administration, which is an arm of the Ministry of Defense of the IDF, essentially. So all of these things together create a legal system that impacts property rights in this area. But the important thing to remember is that no matter which system of law you have in force here, whether it is considering this a, a part of sovereign Israel, or whether you consider Israel an occupying power that is enforcing the Geneva Conventions here, no matter what you consider, Israel is responsible both under international law, conventional law, the Geneva Conventions, or Israeli law. Israel is solely responsible for the administration of this area and that includes issuing building permits and permits for the use of any and all resources in the area. We move on. This map was created by the Oslo Accords. And this is the map that is going to be the most important for us this evening. The Oslo Accords divided, first of all, the Oslo Accords created the Palestinian Authority and then gave that Palestinian Authority jurisdiction over two thirds of Judea and Samaria. The bright red areas, I apologize in advance if any of you are colorblind, I understand that these are very, very poor color choices, they weren't mine. We inherited this map from the Israeli government. But the bright red is area A. Those areas were placed under full Palestinian Authority jurisdiction that includes security and civilian matters. These are the urban concentrations. So the large Arab cities that you've heard of, Shechem, Hebron, Beit Lechem, uh, Tul Karim, those places, the urban, uh, Arab, Arab urban centers are area A. Area B, the maroon colored ones, are rural Arab concentrations. Those were placed under Palestinian Authority control for all civilian matters, and Israel has peripheral security control. The rest of it, area C, is this yellow area. That area was placed under full Israeli jurisdiction. Um, another additional area you'll see down here, these, these are nature reserves that were removed from Area C and given over to the Palestinian Authority for in or, it's another 13% of the territory in order to even out the percentages of land that were given to the two sides. So what you have today is this area under full Israeli jurisdiction uh, and the rest of it these areas under Palestinian Authority jurisdiction. This is what the map should look like. Unfortunately, when we go out in the field, when our coordinator for Judea and Samaria goes out and has a look, that's not what the map looks like. The reality is this map. Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger for you. Oops, went too far. No, sorry, can't make it bigger right now without messing everything up. Okay, so what's the difference between the map of uh, the Oslo map that we saw before and this map, which we've superimposed another layer on. The difference is these purple dots, all of these purple dots. Now, we'll talk about what they are and how they got there and what their impact is. But first, I want you to notice where they are and where they aren't. The purple dots are all along this spine of area C. The purple dots are not in this area of area C, or this part of area C, or this part of area C, they're also not in any of these areas, A or B, right? The purple dots are all along this area of area C, creating, in many cases, a land bridge moving towards Jordan. 
What are these purple dots? Every one of these purple dots is an illegal Palestinian Authority outpost created in areas under full Israeli jurisdiction for the sole purpose of political gain. These were created in order to take control of strategic territory and to create the backbone of a Palestinian state. How do we know this? This is not a, a theory that we've come up with. Very simply, the Palestinian Authority's prime minister 10, over 10 years ago in 2009 announced that it was time to create a Palestinian state. And the way they were going to do that was not through negotiation because they had had four full years of negotiation and were tired of it. Uh, since the day that Israel gave back the very last inch of territory it had agreed to cede to the Palestinian Authority, four years had passed and the Palestinian Authority knew they weren't going to be getting any more through negotiation. Uh, so they decided that they would simply create facts on the ground. So the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, Salam Fayyad, in 2009, launched what has become known as the Fayyad Plan. The Fayyad Plan declared openly and received full support of the European Union about a year and a half later, that it was going to create a de facto Palestinian state specifically in Area C, in the area under Israeli jurisdiction, because the other places were already all taken care of. So this was the area they were targeting. And for the past 10 years, they've gone about this systematically, doing exactly what they said they were going to do. The state of Israel for the past 10 years has systematically ignored what the Palestinian Authority says and what the Palestinian Authority does. And that is why Rigavim does what it does. And that is why we need everybody to be aware of what is happening. Israelis aren't aware of what's happening. I can't imagine that most non-Israelis are aware of what's happening. But when I show you these pictures this evening, you will see what is happening and then you will begin to understand the significance of these purple dots. Now, how did those dots get there? How does the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Authority go about creating one of these illegal outposts? So we counted over 80 of them. Actually, there were probably more, but when we did this study in 2013, there were 85 illegal outposts in Area C in this area that you see here. How did, they get, how did they get there? How does the Palestinian Authority create an outpost? Well, it's really very, very simple. And Salam Fayyad in 2009 announced that the Bedouin were going to be the foot soldiers of Palestinian independence. So the, the Bedouin, as you know, are nomads. They are easily maneuvered, easily manipulated. They are extremely vulnerable, essentially stateless people. And um, they don't need very much in order to be convinced to stay where the Palestinian Authority wants to control territory. So here's what the Palestinian Authority does. See this? This is a European Union vehicle. And these are European, they all have stickers on the sides. You can't see it very well on the tractor, but all of these materials that you see here have European Union stickers on them. The European Union sends material, prefabricated residences, quote unquote, water tankers, tractors, advisors, and they create an outpost. Very, very simple to do. There's only one thing that a Bedouin needs in order to stay in one place. The only reason a Bedouin moves from one place to another with the seasons is to find water. As the seasons change, water sources change in the Middle East. So the Palestinian Authority, very, very simply, used European Union funding and personnel to create these, these outposts by placing water tankers in crucial areas. This little yellow spot here, you can't see it well in this picture, I'll show you a close up in a minute, but this is how it all begins. The Palestinian Authority looks at the map decides where it wants to take control of territory, places a water tanker out there and goes away. The Bedouin in the area congregate around the water and they stay there. Two weeks later, the Palestinian Authority comes with a new full tank of water 
and swaps out the empty one and the Bedouin stay put. And then they begin to create a village with these structures. And the Palestinian Authority is not stupid and the European Union is not stupid. They know very well that if you have a structure with a European Union symbol on the side, the state of Israel will think twice before it tears it down because this is a diplomatic incident and you are destroying EU materials. So the state of Israel makes believe it's not there and makes believe it's not happening so that they don't have to have a confrontation with the European Union. So you get situations like this. You see all these materials out in the, out in the field, water tanks, solar panels, all these little houses, and you find these sorts of enclaves growing up on the countryside. What you see here is this quote unquote village is made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten EU provided structures. They're all identical. They all have the sticker on the side. This particular little village here would not exist. The only structure that wasn't provided by the EU over here is this little uh, lean-to where materials are stored. Everything else was provided by the European Union. We, walk, we found more and more of these all through area C, particularly, we'll look at the map in a minute, but in many of these villages, over 80% of the structures on the ground were provided by the EU. So they create these villages the Bedouin stay there. You notice that these are solar panels. It gives them electrical hookups and it brings water tankers. And presto, you have a village. Now, what we found when we went back out again into the field and looked a little closer at these outposts is that all of these green dots are outposts in which we identified 80% or more of the structures as being provided by the European Union. There are many of them. They wouldn't exist without the EU. The Bedouin who are living in them possibly would be in this area, possibly would not. Many of them started out in these areas, in areas under Palestinian Authority control, but the Palestinian Authority incentivizes them to move into area C. As a matter of fact, only a couple of months ago, the, prime, the current prime minister of the Palestinian Authority announced a whole program of tax and grants incentives for anyone willing to move into the Jordan Valley because that is the area that they are targeting. That, that is the area where it is most likely that Israel will begin uh, extending sovereignty if it does begin. But what we began to notice when we started to connect the dots is that this EU activity is extremely concentrated in particular areas. And you have to ask yourself, why is that? Well, what is all of this? This is a stranglehold around Jerusalem. Jerusalem is here. Dan Iluz's house is here. The Knesset is here. The Kotel is here. And the European Union is creating, is helping the Palestinian Authority create a, a, a mass of illegal construction that makes it impossible for Jerusalem to grow and expand, also makes it impossible for Jerusalem to defend itself to the east and cuts off the country, whoops, sorry, cuts the country more or less, bisects the country north, south and east, west. This whole concentration right here is dead center. That, if you look in the newspapers, is what is known as E1. E1 being east of Jerusalem. E, the first thing to the east of Jerusalem, is this whole mess that the, that the European Union is helping to create, making it impossible to, set, to, to create any kind of normal access to Jerusalem uh, and bisecting the country, creating a spine for the, the backbone of the Palestinian state. This is what we found. 
We began making noise about this over 10 years ago. We began presenting our findings to Prime Minister Netanyahu. We began uh, documenting all of this and it didn't help us very much. I'll show you some pictures now of places you may recognize. This, for example, is Malay Adumim. This is E1, what you're looking at here. Here's some drone images of what you'll see down on the ground. This was actually taken a couple of years ago. The situation is even worse now, but try to notice from above how many of these structures are provided by the European Union. This is all, if you notice the highway in the distance, that's Route 1. In Israel, as everywhere else in the world, when you call a highway Route 1, it's not because it's some small side road, it's because it's a major thoroughfare. This is the road that accesses Jerusalem. Uh, so it has been targeted by the Palestinian Authority with illegal construction on the high points that overlook the road. So, oops, I think we went the wrong way, sorry. Going back here. This one is Route 60. Route 60 is the original highway uh, that, that services all of Judea and Samaria. Look for what the illegal construction situation here looks like. Notice how close it is to the road. Notice how much empty space there is everywhere else but it's all concentrated around the road. This is number one, a violation of the Oslo Accords, a very specific uh, section of the Oslo Accords that prohibits any construction or changes uh, adjacent to major thoroughfares. Number two, this is all without permits. You'll notice also that it has no sewage, running water, roads, transportation, uh, no possibility for normal life here, but people are living here, practically on the highway, this, uh, what you see in the distance here is a quarry. It's extremely unhealthy living conditions, but the Palestinian Authority doesn't care about the health or the well being of the people that they are putting in these homes. They care about taking control of this piece of territory. And they're doing it with literally feet on the ground. So as we send our drone over, we notice more and more of these illegal outposts all along major thoroughfares in crucial strategic points throughout Area C. Let's just keep going. And this is how it looks at the very beginning. This is one of the Palestinian Authority's water tankers. They place this at a strategic point, they go away. The Bedouin collect. What is the next thing that they do in order to create a quote unquote village out of thin air? Very simple, it's a win-win. The next thing they do in every single case is build a school. So this school, for example, is at Khirbet Zanuta. It is actually sitting on top of a protected archaeological site in Area C. Notice the Palestinian flag on top of it. This is at Samoa. This is just another view of the same school. Here's another one, Nebi Samuel, right down the block from Givad Zev, where I live, in Area C. This school built by the European Union, it's illegal. It's not a little tent, it's a school. This one is at Susia, on top of the archeological uh, site at Susia, on a uh, property that belongs to the Jewish community of Susia. Notice, if you will, European Union symbol. Oops, sorry, I'll go back to that. European Union symbol, State of Palestine. This is Area C. Here's another one at Male Chever, or Birin, as they call it. Here's the European Union symbol. Here's the State of Palestine symbol. Here's the school. Every one of these are schools. This one is at, you can't really, I cut, I cropped this picture poorly, but this is the Herodian right here. This is also a protected world heritage site. They just poured cement and plopped a school down right there too. This one we just took to court recently. This one is Kochav HaShachar. It's uh, actually in an area that has never been properly registered uh, in Israel's land registry. It's in the backyard of Kochav HaShachar. That's the school right here. And it's serving a community. Here's the community. As you can see, as well as I can see, there's no community here. 
This is what the Palestinian Authority does to create an illegal community. It starts with a school and then it brings people to populate the school. And then you have all these terrible pictures in the press if, this, if the state of Israel attempts to knock this down. So we've got, and the Palestinian Authority, by the way, doesn't hide their intentions. We have uh, the head of the ministry, the land ministry of the Palestinian Authority, who was talking about what they call confrontation schools. They have 15 new schools, which they build almost overnight in the summer, about a week before the school year starts. And then by the first day of September, they fill them up with kids and it's a fact. And then we have to go to court and take 10 years to try to get it pulled down. So here's a little clip we made about this school. Hello. We're in the heart of Area C, in Judea and Samaria. Uh, and what you see here behind me is a new illegal school building. about this building and over 40 others like it. The Palestinian Authority is using to stay fast on the ground in Judea and Samaria, particularly on land adjacent to Jewish communities. Here we're right near Kufat Shahar, a land that has never been uh, officially regulated by the state of Israel. Uh, and the Palestinian Authority has jumped right in in many of these types of areas, creating fact, creating communities by anchoring them with illegal school books. We've been, as I said, we've been, we've been tracking the development. Naomi, the sound is very low. Can you adjust it? We're about to I'll try. A new Supreme Court petition against this construction. But as you can see, construction is carrying on. The roof of this structure will get to the top of the next week. So we decided to have a look at how progress is being made. Um, this is your European taxpayers' money at work. And the state of Israel is not lifting a finger to stop this land grab before it's too late. You can see around you that there is no community that this school building is servicing. It's the other way around. Happens is creating this permanent structure, which is used as an anchor or a draw for more population to collect and more and more people to come. Here we see we're already starting to put in desks and chairs for children. And in a week's time, when they open this building, there'll be terrible public relations photos all over the internet, and there'll be an international outcry about how the state of Israel is denying education to the underprivileged children of this community, which doesn't exist. The time to deal with this is right now, and that's why Ray is going to the High Court of Justice to stop this illegal construction before it's too late. Okay, so, whoops. So that is one new example of a phenomenon we've been fighting in the courts for 10 years or more. The case that you see in front of you right here is probably the most famous case of this pattern of uh, territorial land seizure. Uh, this is called Khan al Ahmar. Many of you have heard of it. The road you see on the left side of your picture is Route 1. Uh, and this we've taken through this Israel's High Court of Justice through six different rounds of petitions for over 10 years. A year and a half ago, Prime Minister Netanyahu promised that this would be removed uh, in a matter of days. It's still there. This is the flagship, the Palestinian Authority's flagship case. I see that my time is running short, so I'm not going to give you the full history of Khan al Ahmar. But the people who are living here started out the exact same way water tankers, the first permanent structure on the site was a school. And that's when we took it to court in 2009. And the case has been going on ever since. What we do when we get a case like this is we research. We go to the state archives and we find aerial photos of this area dating back to the relevant time period. So this is what Khan al Ahmar looked like in 1967. There was absolutely nothing there. This is the exact same area in 1980. This is the exact same area in 1999. This is what it looked like in 2008. Now, different seasons, you can see that there's some sort of activity on the ground because Bedouins are 
seasonal nomads. So if you take the pictures in the winter, you'll see a few tents, but if you take them in the summer, there's nothing there, meaning there's no permanent settlement at the site. This is what it looked like in 2013. And this is Bimkom, a radical left-wing New Israel Fund supported NGOs history of Khan al-Akhmar. They tried to prove that Khan al-Akhmar should stay where it is, weren't really successful because even they showed that in 1977 and 1987 and 1992, there was really no village there. Well, what I, I like to point out on this Bimkom publication is this. Have a look at how many Khan al-Akhmars they identify in this area. How many are there? One, two, three, four, five, at least six right here because they create villages faster than mushrooms pop up after the rain. They simply put a water tanker there, give it a name, and now it's a village. And when you drive through here, if you look at Google Maps, you'll see names of villages all over the place and no villages. This is what Khan al-Akhmar looks like on a day when the European Union comes with supplies and flags and hosts parades and dignitaries. You can see all this happening pretty much on any sunny day. But this is where the people who are living there are actually supposed to be living by now. The state of Israel invested millions to create an alternative for those people, even though they're not Israeli citizens and we have no responsibility for them. The state of Israel took a piece of state owned land just outside of Abu Dis, about four and a half kilometers away from their present site, developed all these residential plots and is offering them a quarter of a million shekel each to relocate to this, it, to this location in order not to be on the road in the illegal structures that they're living in now. And the Palestinian Authority and the European Union will not allow them to accept the State of Israel's relocation offer. So who's creating the humanitarian crisis and who's solving it? I leave that to you. Those things that we saw have now morphed into all of this. This is a different area. It's not in E1 anymore. This is in the IDF firing zone known as 917. If any of you are familiar with the community of Carmel uh, in the South Hebron area, this was a large IDF uh, infantry training zone. The, Bedouin, the Palestinian Authority has taken it over and you can see who's involved in creating this. Here's Belgium, whoops, Belgium, France, the EU, Sweden, oh, why is it doing that? The United Kingdom, that's Abu Dhabi, by the way, our new friends. Everybody's in on the act. What are they doing here? They are creating a city on Israeli land and the state of Israel has done nothing to stop it. So I'm going to show you this and we'll wrap up with this and I'll leave time for some questions. But this is just to give you an idea of what happens when you have tents uh, and you don't remove them, or you have those little prefab structures that the EU provides and you don't remove them right away. This was taken in 2016 from our dashboard camera. Since then, there are hundreds more structures, but these are not little tents, these are not shacks, these are not prefabricated aluminum uh, structures that are provided by the EU. These are massive 10 room mortar and brick stone houses with paved roads. There's even street signs there now. There are traffic signs. All the electricity is dragged in from Yatta, which is far away, all with European Union money. Uh, the water is all either stolen from Mikorot or it is brought, it piped in from Yatta as well. And there are hundreds of families living in this new city in Area C. All of this is illegal. And this is just goes on and on and on. This is what happens when you leave a place like Khan al-Akhmar and you just ignore it, make believe it's not there. It doesn't go away. It turns into a city. And here you have it. The state of Israel has lost this land. There's nothing anyone can do about it now. And our goal is to make the government of Israel stand up and behave like a sovereign, to take responsibility for our land reserves 
and to ensure that we have someplace left to grow and develop. Because at the rate we're going right now, Area C is disappearing at an incredible rate. Just how quickly? Well, let's have a look. We mapped out all of the things that we found. This is the same map of Judea and Samaria we showed you before. We mapped out how much space is in each of these sections. We mapped out all per square mile. But this is the map that's really interesting. This map, we did something that no one else has ever done. Palestinian claims often are that they build illegally in Area C for two reasons. Number one, because the state of Israel doesn't give them permits, so they have to build illegally. And number two, because they have nowhere else to go. They have to live somewhere. So we did two things. Number one is we went onto the website of the civil administration just to see how many building permits. The website is open to anyone who wants to. You can go and look at it yourselves today. I'll even put up a link afterwards. So as of 2013, which is the last time they put up uh, this kind of information, 17 and a half thousand building projects, not units, but projects were given permits by the state of Israel in area C in the Arab sector. That's a lot. And the second thing we did was have a look at whether or not they have space to grow, whether or not they really actually have to build in area C. And the answer is absolutely not. This is the statistic you should be looking at. 63% of the land reserves in areas A and B, the areas under full Palestinian authority control, are empty. They don't need any Israeli permission to build here. They don't need anything from anyone. And the resources that they're using from the European Union could be building for all of their needs now and in the future in all of these land reserves in areas A and B that are empty, but they don't do that. They build in area C for political reasons. Another thing you should look at on this map is these little blue dots. The little blue dots are all Israeli construction in Judea and Samaria. All the noise, all the condemnations, all the public outcry, all the international pressure relating to quote unquote, illegal Israeli construction in Judea and Samaria relates to these blue dots. And that's less than 1% of the total area of Judea and Samaria. If you take it as a percentage of area C, it's just under 2% of the total. That means there's a lot of open space out there, but that open space is being gobbled up by the Palestinian Authority's concerted efforts to seize land through illegal construction we have identified over 60,000 illegal structures in Area C. And they are taking up all of Judea and Samaria. So keep your eye on this. The green dots here are the Israeli construction. The pink dots is what we saw in 2009. And the red is now 2019. Illegal construction in Judea and Samaria by the Pal Palestinian Authority has more than doubled in the last 10 years. And the Israeli government has only in the past nine months begun to admit that this is a strategic threat. Thanks to Rigavim's incessant hounding of the government, they have finally begun to relate to illegal construction in Area C as a battleground. And we hope that the new awareness will continue despite the political turmoil in Israel and that the government of Israel will continue to take this threat seriously. This is how you can find out more information, either by going onto our website, our Facebook, or our Twitter. I encourage you, all of our research is on the website. Just look for maps and policy papers. You can see all of our reports, all of our studies, all of the maps that we showed you this evening, uh, and get regular updates on Facebook and Twitter of our findings and our activities. That is the story of illegal construction in Area C and what we're trying to do about it. Um, I'd be happy to take questions now. Let me just stop sharing the screen. Thank you, Ray. Thank you so much. This was a really fascinating uh, presentation, fascinating and frustrating at the same time, I think, for most people. Uh, so I, I'm going to start asking questions from the chat. Uh, I have two questions, uh, three questions here from uh, the same person, Len Getz, 
So uh, I'll ask all three and maybe you can answer them uh, at uh, however you want, okay? Okay. Uh, the first question is, why do you have to go to court? Uh, does the EU have any legal rights in Israel? The second question uh, basically uh, is related to the last things that you ended with. Why isn't the government taking the dangers of this encroachment seriously? Uh, and the last one is if you can answer, where does Naftali Bennett stand on this encroachment? Okay. I'll start with the first one. I hope that I will keep it all uh, organized. The first question was, uh, why do we have to go to court? So first of all, we don't start going to court. We start at the bottom. We start, first of all, with approaching the person who's in charge in area C, that is the civil administration. We have, there's a bureaucratic process. We submit in a formal complaint, documentation. We generally get either no answer or a standard pat answer that we will um, address this issue according to our list of priorities and they ignore it and it goes on. So then we uh, go up the chain, we go further and further, we go to the ministry, we go to, uh, and, and then if we have to, we go to court. But why do we have to go to court against the European Union? It's an interesting thing in Israel. The Supreme Court, uh, several years back under the, um, under Justice Aaron Barak made a decision that there is universal legal standing uh, in Israeli courts. That means that anyone can submit a lawsuit in, an Israeli, in the Israeli courts, which means you don't have to even be a party to the problem. You don't have to be a citizen. So that's how we get massive lawfare in Israeli court systems. The European Union and the Palestinian Authority completely choke the Israeli legal system with uh, cases they know they can't possibly win, but it fills the courts. They have a backlog of decades because they have unlimited funds and they simply keep on stalling um, by, by petitioning the courts against demolition or relocation orders or all those sorts of things. So yes, we have to go to court because the court system in Israel has been uh, stacked in favor of the lawbreakers and their supporters. Yeah, that was the first question. The second question, uh, Naftali Bennett. So when Naftali Bennett was a Minister of Defense for a very short time, unfortunately, uh, last year, this past year, he did more in the six months that he was there than any Minister of Defense has done in decades to address these problems. He appointed a project director, um, a very, very talented and serious and knowledgeable person named Kobe Ali Raz, uh, to oversee what they finally agreed to call the battle for Area C. And he instituted a policy that changed the uh, priorities for law enforcement against illegal construction. And the rate of demolition of new construction uh, increased impressively since the time that Naftali Bennett was there. He is definitely an ally of ours in, in, this, in this battle. So that was that. And there was a, a third part of the question, which I can't remember what it was. The, 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 it's why isn't the government taking the, the dangers of this encroachment seriously? I have to say that this is something that's uh, coming from a lot of uh, questions that we're seeing in the chat. People are asking <laughs> it differently, but it's the same question. Uh, I, I can't answer this without being a little bit cynical. So I'm gonna try not to be cynical because I know that's a very, very unflattering stance to take. Um, the state of Israel since 1967 has proven over and over again that it is afraid of its own power. The, Israel is completely within its legal rights to do something about this, uh, but doesn't really wanna pick a fight with the rest of the world. Um, Something that I learned a very long time ago from my mother, may she rest in peace, is that it's never going to happen that everybody's going to love you. You have to choose who it is that you want on your side and who it is that you're willing to go up against. At this point, the state of Israel is not making a whole lot of friends by not taking a strong stance. So it may as well take a strong stance. Um, what can I say? I think it's, it's cowardice. Uh, too much looking over your shoulder, 
too much wor worrying what, what the others are going to say and what kind of condemnations you're going to get. The European Union is going to condemn any action that we take. But can we really face our children and our grandchildren and explain to them how it is that we squandered their birthright because we were afraid what the Europeans would say? I don't think so. I have no good answer for that question. That's why we push and we push and we push in order to force the government to look at the hard realities that it doesn't want to look at because it's a lot of work, it's an uphill battle, you're gonna make enemies along the way, but it has to be done. Uh, I'm gonna ask another question from Michael Goodman. Uh, is Regavim active only in Judea and Samaria? Absolutely not. Regavim is um, one of our main, uh, well, several of our main accomplishments in recent years um, have been actually not in Judea and Samaria. We were instrumental in creating what's known as the Kamenitz Law, which the members of the United Arab List have been very, very hard at work for the past six months to try to repeal. The Kamenitz Law finally enabled the state of Israel to get a handle on illegal construction everywhere in the country, uh, which is why the United Arab List is so adamant against it, because in the Arab sector in the north of Israel, illegal construction is an absolute plague, which is gobbling up land reserves and inter interfering with development and planning all through the north of Israel. So uh, yes, we worked for almost seven years to create enforcement, an enforcement code for Israel's planning and construction law. Um, and that has affected, that has brought down illeg new illegal construction starts in the north of the country by over 50% in one year. So yes, we're very active there. We've created a a master plan, which has now been more or less adopted as government policy. We worked on this also for about five years to resolve the problem of ownership claims and land use in the Negev, the entire conflict with the Bedouin in the Negev. Who owns what? How do you prove it? How do you divide the land resources of the Negev uh, with, uh, with an eye toward the future of the Jewish state? And how do you get citizens of Israel non-Jewish citizens of Israel engaged in the process. So we've created a, a master plan. I encourage you to look on our website and see it. It's called the Negev Challenge. Um, and it not only analyzes the problem, but offers extremely practical solutions for resolving the problem. So we're very, very active there as well. We would like to take a more active role in Jerusalem proper. Right now, we're only involved in cases in Jerusalem where we've been asked uh, specifically to get involved, but we don't do our regular field work in Jerusalem simply because we don't have the resources. Anyone who'd like to uh, donate and help us uh, bring on a full-time field coordinator to do what we do in Jerusalem. I don't know how many of you are aware of the challenges in Jerusalem right now, but they are tremendous and they're getting, <clears throat> they're getting worse, <coughs> excuse me, because <clears throat> the Turkish government and the United Nations have poured <clears throat> nearly half a billion dollars each into projects of theirs, Palestinian statehood projects in Jerusalem in the past year. That's the United Nations, $420 million last year alone. That's what we're up against. Um, so yes, we're active all through Israel. Thank you so much. Uh, we're out of time, but there's a ton of questions left. So I suggest, Naomi, uh, that you put your uh, email in the chat. Uh, so that if people have more questions, they'll be able to contact you directly uh, and they'll be able to get answers from you uh, directly. Uh, before we leave, I want to announce some of the webinars that we have coming up. We have a really interesting lineup coming up. First of all, we have the ZOA book club tomorrow. Uh, featuring Ken Abramowitz uh, and his book, The Multi-Front War, Defending America from Political Islam, China, Russia, Pandemics, and Racial Strife. Uh, the webinar will be moderated by Liz Burney, and it's happening tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, on November 24th at 7 p.m., uh, we have Zionism Matching Knowledge with Passion, featuring Alex uh, Rivchin, uh, co-CEO of the Executive Council of Australian Jury, 
and author of two internationally acclaimed books of history and politics, The Anti-Israel Agenda, Inside the Political War on the Jewish State and Zionism, The Concise History. Uh, on December 2nd, we spoke about Naftali Bennett in this webinar, so we're very proud to also host Naftali Bennett for a special webinar. It will be at noon on, on December 2nd, and he will be uh, uh, speaking about Israel's rights to Judea and Samaria and the dangers of a Palestinian state. I want, and I also want to finish by reiterating the virtual gala that Alan spoke about uh, at the beginning of the program, the virtual superstar gala that's happening on December 27th. Uh, at 7 p.m. with very special guests, including Ambassador David Friedman, uh, Dr. Miriam Adelson, and the new Ambassador Gilad Erdan to the uh, UN and to the United States. Uh, John Voigt, Mort Klein will be obviously, uh, our national president will also be there obviously. Uh, and that's about it for all of the future programs. If you're you like our programs and you like the webinars and you like everything that we do for Israel, then we always encourage you to also contribute and to help us uh, keep having these incredible programs. Uh, you can go on our website at zoa.org uh, and you'll find a way to donate to us. Thank you so much, Naomi, and thanks everyone for being here.